thanks very much indeed peter that was that was that, that that was that was a potent and in, to my mind incontrovertible um argument in terms of the basis in which you've set it up so uh, let me let me uh, throw up throw, throw open the conversation to to comments or uh, questions for peter anyone like to comment on that i'd like to comment myself see this book here yeah um, I can't see it so well myself. Can you see the title? A Revolution Too Far. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. And this is published 1994. And if you look at page 235 in this book, difficult to see, but yeah, third equation down on this page, 235. I don't know whether you can see it there. It's very difficult to see that. Can you see it at all? That's the A equals H naught squared R equation. John, John, you're muted. We cannot hear you. No, Peter, we cannot hear you. Holding it off to the side so we cannot see the equation. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to, to show it. Move it. Move it in. Move it a little bit left. Little bit left, little bit left, more left, more left, up a bit, up a bit, up a bit, up a bit. There it is. Yes. Okay. Good. You see it? Yep. Um, well, prior prediction is established. 1994, long time before all this. So, um, dark energy then. Um, Now, at the critical value of, 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 of two thirds, you have a process by which the universe is, is being driven to expansion by this dark energy. And we also have a universe, too, I and mean, we're here at the end of the universe. What? Can, can, can you comment on, 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 on this in the context of the Big Bang and in terms of matter creation per se? We're an evolving universe in this, aren't we, in terms of, in terms of mass density, in terms of being pushed out? An evolving infinite universe. Um, how's matter being created, and how's that zero energy universe being maintained in that uh, in that situation? Well, as you know, I'm not in favour of matter creation nor the Big Bang theory, so I, I don't feel I have to explain that. But if people want to explain things in those terms, then they then there are various possibilities they can use. So I'm throwing it open to them, saying, we, you know, we need to look at our cosmologies. If, even if you're a Big Bang cosmologist, you need to look at it to 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 find out how you slot in this petite piece of information into it. Anyone care? I don't have to explain. Uh, yeah, that. I, I, I uh, Wolfgang here. Uh, Peter, this is fantastic. I, I just love it because it's one of the first ones that I actually fully, I think fully, somewhat fully understand, but I have a question. Uh, I looked at Skiyama's work uh, quite a bit. In fact, uh, uh, in my book, I have a, a very short uh, appendix to, to re represent his calculations, but I've always had a problem, and maybe you can explain this, and this has to do with the long range one over R uh, that you showed, uh, because when I looked at it, I said, well, if that is a relationship basically between the magnetic and the uh, equivalent gravitational sort of magnetic momentum field, uh, and I look at the magnetic one, then uh, the magnetic uh, influence uh, does decrease as 1 over r squared, and I've always been puzzled, how do I get the 1 over r, which uh, Skiyama also uh, I believe, uh, didn't exactly explain in his papers, but hinted at, I would say more hinted at than explained. So do you have a, do, can you, can you help me out on that one? Um, I can't at the moment, but I think John might be able to, because he's an expert on electromagnetic theory more than I am. And, uh, but it's a standard equation. I mean, I, I haven't made it up. And in any case, there's another way of deriving all this. You can derive it as just as a special relativistic um, uh, correction. You can derive it by using um, special relativistic terms in 
in the gravitational law. If you put special relativistic corrections into that, you will get this extra term. You know, there's a totally other way of deriving it, which is equivalent. But, um, I mean, I've looked up the, the electromagnetic theory textbooks and I find, that, find you know, that, um, that, um, that formula, the, the formula for the, the, um, the long distance formula, is inductive. I think you've got inductive field and you've got radiation field, and this is the inductive field, I think. But I'm not, I'm not a great expert on electromagnetic theory. So anybody who hears might be able to explain it better than me. John? Can't hear, can't hear, can't hear. There could be a difference in, in, in terms of the fracture of uh, the But uh, no, I don't understand it uh, straight away. I'll need to think about that one more. It's a good question. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I can understand it perhaps in terms of another um, a, a, another way of looking at this. If I'm looking at dark energy as being some physical thing which is spread throughout the whole universe, then 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 the one over R term could be taken from the rate of acceleration due to that rather than a, a magnetic inductive one. But um, it doesn't occur to me straight away why there should be a difference between the two of them or the dual forces. There's no or difference between the gravitational and the electromagnetic. I mean, what we're talking about here is whether the electromagnetic one is one over R for the inductive force. Right, right. But, but that's that's the whole point. Um, that that's why Sharma picked on it because this is a long range force, completely different from the ordinary one over R squared. Well, the implications are in, in, in enormous because the one over R squared gives you a, a one kind of limit to the uh, forces. If there is a one over R long range force, then then, then, then it goes on completely uh, uh, further and different than anything that we have been uh, talking about in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a limit to the to the forces. That means that that basically we're talking a potential of uh, multiverse uh, concepts and all kinds of things like that. Because uh, I think there is well, a limit for because of the Hubble radius. If you look at the Sharma calculation, the Hubble radius limits it because it, it is entirely dependent on the on the velocity of light. And if there's no velocity of light involved, then that wouldn't be limited. But there is a velocity of light involved, so that limits it to the Hubble radius. And so it doesn't go into infinity. It, it, well, it, yes, but if the velocity of light is assumed to be the velocity of gravitation, which I think there's some question then and that may not be completely correct well i don't believe it is the velocity of gravitation at all and I, nor do i believe that these are a, a, these are really true forces i think it's a fictitious force um that, that that's always been my belief is that um, i'll give you a, a historical um example connected with this um there are 42 propositions in book three of Newton's Principia, and he intended at one time to include a 43rd, which has only come to light in the last few years. And in this, in this, he said, how do we know that we are not in a Tychonic universe in which the, we are the center and the sun goes round us and the planets go around the sun. This was Tycho's theory of the universe. How do we know we're not in, a, in such a universe? And he said that in principle, there's no way of knowing we're not in one because there could be an equal and opposite force um, opposing the gravitation. There could be what we might call an in, inertial force opposing it. And if I think about that, that is exactly what the Sharma type force is. It's an equal and opposite force making us appear to be still and the rest of you, the universe appear to revolve around us. And th this, but if it's a real, if it was a real force, then we would be the center of the universe. For us not to be the center of the universe, it has to be fictitious. And uh, this is, this is quite remarkable. Um, I don't believe that gravity does travel at the speed of light. I believe gravitational waves do, but they're not gravity. And in fact, we know it doesn't, nor does the electrostatic force. Both of them 
the fields are there already all the time. It's only changes that we observe at the speed of light, localized changes. Mm -hmm. we, we, we can't actually uh, give a, a um, propagation speed for the, the field because it doesn't have one. It's just there. And apparently, if one looks at the argument, I've, looked, I've checked this up and I've checked it in various places, including a, an interesting Wikipedia article on it, then if, if, we, if, if it didn't travel instant, if it wasn't instantaneous, the field, then special relativity would be violated. And it explains why. Uh, yes, I agree with everything that you're saying there. Uh, well, no more questions, but uh, fantastic. I, I love it. I'd love to get a copy and, and but, study but this even, stuff. Even if, the, even if the Mackian argument was wrong, it doesn't alter the fact that two-thirds is very suggestive for connecting the velocity and the acceleration term. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, my, my own work has to do with integrating, you know, the subjective uh, into physics and so on and so forth. So this uh, idea that we are the center of the universe uh, is, is, is very, very central to, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an individual personal uh, uh, representation of the whole thing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether I agree with the fictitious versus non-fictitious. I mean, that's a subjective, I think, uh, call because, uh, you know, when I'm in a, in a, a cyclotron or, or, I mean, some, something that goes around, you know, a carousel or so, uh, you know, I, I feel forces, whether or not they're fictitious or not, is, uh, uh, well, I think it's just, a question of, of you know what what you like to call them but uh, i've never i've never felt that the whole argument about uh, centripetal forces being fictitious is, is bad so um, anyway uh, uh this is this is absolutely fantastic for me so i thank you so thank you very much sorry you have uh, Peter, uh, this is Charlie here from Saskatoon. Uh, uh, Peter, I want to um, kind of echo what uh, what Wolfgang just said. We're, we're just enjoying this kind of a conversations, and it's really interesting indeed. And uh, and also giving the perspective. Um, I was talking to John yesterday, asking about the dark energy, and then he asked me to wait uh, until today so that I could hear from you. And I'm very glad that I, I I'm here and I'm listening to you. That's that's wonderful. I have got one question and a comment, perhaps. I want to ask you this thing. From your derivations, which you showed that your acceleration is simply proportional to velocity. So this reminds me of the frictional force or damping forces that we come across, which can lead to the oscillating universe concept, or the idea that you have something which is uh, opposing each other. Basically, that's what you're doing. So do you are uh, foresee a situation where the gravitational cancels the this acceleration that you're putting in there, and then we are going to be a terminal velocity somewhere? Oh, that's you need to unmute your microphone, Peter. And that if you have a force proportional to velocity, then that's similar to what you get in some frictional forces exactly, yeah. and some other resistive forces, like in Stokes' law and so on. Yep. Um, it, it could, it, 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 it's certainly possible that that could have something to do with the fact that we have a stable universe. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's quite possible that that's necessary to a stable universe. But this is anti-resistive, isn't it? Sorry? This is anti-resistive, isn't it? In the sense that it's... <laughs> yeah. Same form, but opposite direction. Yeah. And in fact, it's a, it's a kind of Hooke's law, isn't it? And it's, it's a natural right, yeah. direction. Because Hooke's law is, in the, is attractive, where this is repulsive. Uh, but but, but I, I, I've got to say, I'll tell you... But something else that I think is, I, I have never believed in the in the graviton per se. But I think that because I don't, I think gravity is really the vacuum part of the interaction, and that inertia is the local part. It's it's the reverse of the other three forces, whereas the vacuum part is the let's say what we. Not the fictitious part, but the um, what's the word that? You, no, the the the, uh, the vacuum part. It doesn't matter. The the vacuum part is, yeah, is is not the real part of the force. The the real part is the is the local interaction. 
but the vacuum part is the kind of non-real uh, part with the rest of the universe, as it were. No, but yeah, no, no, no. The, 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 but gravity is the rest of the universe, and the local part is the inertia of the body, the inertial mass and the inertia. And I, th I think it's the, it's the other way around for gravity. It's a kind of reverse of the other three. And I, I tend to think in people talk about gravity, gauge theory, correspondence. I tend to think of gravity and gauge theory cancelling each other out, but, but one being attractive and the other repulsive for light particles. Would you say they cancelled each other out precisely to give zero? Yeah, yeah. 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 totally zero. But, it's the, but you can write down that the gravity is the exact opposite. And it reverses all the conditions for the gauge forces. So the gauge part of it is the inertial part. Now, if the gauge part is the inertial part, then the the, the bosonic part for the gauge part is not going to be spin two, but spin one, which is renormalizable. And my problem is this: when you talk about the gravity, it doesn't have anything to do with the velocity of the bodies involved. It's simply a proportionality distance which we have there. Now you have a force here, which is like a frictional force or Hooke's law, ter uh, terminal velocity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, what we can put in there, all those forces, which are dependent upon the velocity. Now, when we have these two things, we have a common observation we teach in always undergraduate classes how they things move around in a constant velocity and so forth. Famous Millikan oil drop experiment of 1920s, in fact, corresponds to that that aspect. So, given that situation, I'm, I'm just wondering whether you can uh, conceive of a universe which it, uh, which oscillates and then after a while it comes to a terminal velocity and then hangs around and goes moves on so on and so forth that's what i'm asking i think it i i, I don't can consider that particularly because i'm i believe in the stability of the universe i don't believe it's come from nowhere and going to nowhere, me, it it just nowhere already. i'm but, sorry but to, I to accept any possible I'm prepared to throw this out and say you can develop all kinds of cosmologies much might relate to it. But if you don't take this into account with your cosmology, then I think your cosmology is no good. If, if you don't take this fundamental fact into account in the cosmology, then you cannot get a good cosmology. But I, I'm, I'm prepared to throw it open to the cosmologists to, to, um, to, to work on, on that aspect. But, I, but my own belief it isn't really in that kind of cosmology, but I'm prepared to listen to to people who, who believe differently to me. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed this discussion. And uh, as I was telling John quite a few times, and this is really a, a kind of a good food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ex I'd like to explore further what you're saying about, um, and, and I think I agree with you as well that there are two velocities involved with gravitational waves and with the gravitational plenum, if you like, the, the system which is particle plus rest of the universe. One being essentially just there, as you say, the other one being the disturbance in what is just there. Now, um, that disturbance is light speed experimentally because we've seen the gravitational waves, they arrive at the same time as associated gravitational objects. So um, now, my view of what gravity might be is different. It's a shadow force of electromagnetism and hence traveling that disturbance is, and if you, if you, if you took a very large, black hole and took it just here and without any gravitational waves, if I'm standing here and you moved it up and down, I would feel that Gravi just from the fact that, gravi that the gravitational thing that I'm moving up and down is moving. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's a gravitational wave being transmitted through space, of course. It just means that the thing which I'm looking at has moved and the gravitational attraction is now in a different direction. Could you comment on the, on, on, on you, you said yourself also that you're looking at something which is essentially an infinite speed for gravity and the speed of light speed for um, gravitational disturbance. Could you comment on how that fits with your view of what's happening in the universe? Yeah, well, if you look at um, Einstein's uh, examples of uh, physical explanations for his, um, his um, gravita gravitational equations, and the, all the il illustrations he uses are all inertial ones. I think we're looking at the inertia and not at the gravity because the, the, I think the inertia is the response to the gravity and that's what we're looking at. And it's not the same thing as the, as the gravity, though the mass turns out to be the same value. The, the, the mechanism is different. Yeah, the mechanism is different, but they're proportional to one another, you would say. And I think Einstein would say the same. 
but that's always how we yeah. look. Yeah, that, that's, that's the principle of equivalence, and that's necessary to what I was doing. But um, I still don't... Uh, I, I think that you have to look to see um, whether your gravity is in fact acting uh, as a as a as a local force, or whether it isn't, or whether that's the inertia part of it that's doing that. And we we lump them all together as part of gravity, but they're not the same thing. They're different. Just just like the the vacuum part of the electromagnetic force is not the same as the local interaction. I think also okay. what you're saying is also exactly true for the charge side. There's a duality there. There are two kinds of charge. One sort of charge is an energy exchange charge, as in quantum electronics. And the other kind of charge is a field charge, is the thing that produces an electric field and charge. And they are also proportional, but not precisely the same thing, just as the proportionality between gravity and inertia takes place. Yeah, but there are there are for every interaction there is a local way of doing it and a non-local way of doing it. You're either looking at the object or the rest of the universe without that object. So uh, I think you can actually always transfer from the local to the non-local, and from the non-local to the local. You can always rewrite it in a new way. So um, to me, that the Coulomb forces, uh, particularly the electromagnetic one but the coulomb parts of other ones are really due to Pauli exclusion you can show that that, that from the nil potent structure that the only thing that keeps it nil potent is having a, a coulomb in, interaction term in the energy part of it and so that to me says that you've got a non-local effect which you call Pauli exclusion which produces a local interaction and that that, that takes place within the the um within the, the, fermi the fermionic nilpotent bracket, it takes place in there, the local part. And every interaction is the same in one way or another. That, that you, you can exchange the non-local effect for a field term within the particle. I see exactly what you're saying, and I think that's a very, very potent principle. I think you should really call this nilpotent... I think you should call it a nilpotent principle, because as soon as you apply that, then you have the two sides of this thing. You have the universe, the effect on the universe, and the inversion of that or a reflection of that in the particle itself so as soon as you say and that's the kind of terms you're talking about i think when you're thinking about this then by doing that you make the connection between the two and the two then have a proportionality between one another well are different aspects of the same thing which is giving rise to a zero energy universe in my view so it, it, it also makes calculation a lot easier because you got double the amount of information you're right from one thing you, you you double your information which makes it much easier to do calculations but this brings me back to the question i asked you right at the beginning um you, you have this beautiful view of the nil potence of, of of systems and i think we believe in common you and i that the total energy of the universe is just is zero and that we're simply a much more likely sort of zero so um so the question still remains as to how the whole thing was created and now i'm completely with you in that it wasn't a big bang but um can i throw that open to everybody else does anyone else have some pet theories of where the universe came from apart from a big bang that they'd like to uh, to share with us here as well i mean uh, my, my question is why do we need to assume a beginning there's nothing in the physical laws of the universe that indicate that it needs to have a beginning it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a boundary to our perception, which could be redshifting light into oblivion. As um, John, I plead ignorance. John, you're muted. Sorry, I'm getting a bit deaf even when I'm not muted. What was that, Gary? I said, yeah, I said, I said, I plead ignorance. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We, if we can't know, then we can't stay. That's true. Yes. Well, what you I, find. I, I think I'm with Arnie on that. That's the way I think of it. And but the very least, we should try to explain cosmology in terms of physics laws, not in terms of archaeology, as we do at the moment. Um, I have a question, Peter. Well, to answer, oh. okay. To answer uh, a little bit of your question, I think that uh, if we consider nothing uh, in in your cosmology or in, in, in your ideas, Peter, as a um, 
an ideal perfect system you know one which which is where everything is exactly the way all the fields expect it to be in other words uh, the empty space that then provides a whole versus uh, a fermion uh, in in many of your ideas uh, if that becomes a perfect system one in which the uh, uh, you know the, the the fields exactly tell the material where to be and the and the material is exactly where the fields want it to be uh, then rather than if we introduce that as a nothingness then there is a something if you will uh, a perfection of some kind uh, uh, that represents the nothing and it's a disturbance to that perfection that generates our uh, visible universe. Um, I, I, I think I've actually talked to you about that and, and you partially agree. I'm not sure. but Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can think of it that way. And I think that's your zeros. Are, it, zero is an infinitely degenerate concept anyway. So there isn't a zero. There's just all zeros, an infinite number of zeros. There's an infinite types of zero forever and ever, but it's got to be zero. Yes, exactly. Infin in infinite degenerate zero. Yes, right, right. While this has been going on, I've been thinking about Peter's question back at the beginning about the possible um, difference between charge orbiting gravitation as inverse square and the uh, electromagnetic uh, equivalent of magnetic induction as one over R. And I think I have a possible um, route to understanding that, and that is that the dimensionality of space-time has been changed by the transformation of going to induction. So one over R is a is a it, it, it would be the rule if we had a two dimensional universe where one over R squared is for a three dimensional one over R cubed for a four dimensional if one's considering a flux so a flux that's expanding goes one over R squared one over R now I need to think about this more but it occurs to me that the one over R may come from the fact that as you go to a light speed system you're losing a dimension you're losing the dimension that's the contracted dimension in the direction of uh, in the direction of travel and that transforms you effectively from a three-dimensional plus one to a losing a dimension to going to a two-dimensional plus one system, perhaps. But I'll need to think about that a bit more before I come to some definitive one, but a lovely question. That's interesting, John, what you just said right now. You can imagine, perhaps, I'm just thinking along your lines, basically, two-dimensional, two you got something like analogous to circumference of a, a, a circle, for example. Whereas you can think about this uh, surface area a, a sphere, which is R square dependence and so forth. Exactly. Along that lines, if you're trying to uh, include in more, you can basically say maybe R to the power of n minus one dependence, perhaps inverse. That that seems to be something which you're uh, hitting at. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. So, sorry, I was just watching what Lyndon was doing. That yes, that's right. It, it's exactly the flux over a perimeter over a, over, over a circle compared to the flux over a, over a sphere. Yeah. Yeah, some, yeah. some this kind of yeah. yeah, that's good. That's that's it makes sense. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Peter, I have a historical question, if I may. Um, it's my limited understanding that Einstein felt differently about the cosmological constant at different points in his career. I, I was hoping you might just share a word about that. Well, you mean sometimes he thought it was a good idea. Sometimes he thought it was a bad idea. At first, he thought it was a good idea. And then when the expanding universe came into being in the 1920s, he thought it was a bad idea. And then later on, I think he may have come back to thinking possibly it's not such a bad idea. That's right. In, in a very later period of his life, you're thinking that again. His, his view of the, was the, of the cosmological constant was something that uh, kept it from collapsing. You know, it, it wasn't something that gave it an acceleration. Um, but however, you know, it had the same effect. I think if I look at my, my view of what might be happening here now, it's effectively not a cosmological constant, but a cosmological variable that you need. Something which is which is globally globally has an average value, which uh, is providing an expansion to the universe, but globally could vary. Now, this is. When I'm thinking about this, this is really a conjecture, and this is really speculation on top of speculation. But um, but but then I'm, I'm thinking about something which is like a cosmological constant, but then a variable constant. So lambda is a function of position. 
and uh, eventually that may yield something or not. It depends on whether or not that fits with observation, of course, eventually. The, the word constant is loosely used here, like as in um, it could well be a variable, just, just as in um, um, Hubble constant. So you want a, a you want a lambda parameter rather than a lambda constant. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to remember that that it, it's often I hate this phrase. You know, Einstein said or for Einstein, that really pisses me off. That kind of thing because the idea that Einstein only thought one thing ever for somebody like Einstein is just such an insult. Well, he had very many different versions of a unified field theory, so that's proof that he didn't always think the same thing. He yeah, came yeah. up with one word after another. Isn't it fantastic? There's so much there. There's reams and reams on it, a different, tri different trial and error. It's beautiful. And he wasn't the only one. We were just complaining a little bit earlier about how much was coming out at the moment in terms of science as a whole, how it was impossible to follow. But think about the contemporaries of Dirac and Einstein in the 50s and trying to follow them, just the two of them. Whoa, not, not easy. Schrodinger used to contribute a lot to that as well, I believe. Oh, you're not wrong. Schrodinger was, I, I think, although he's very famous, I think he's hugely underrated as well. That was a genius as well. A, a lot of the things that are attributed to others came with Schrodinger first. So... Uh, So, John, you mentioned you thought the uh, total energy of the universe was zero. So I, I thought that uh, there was no such thing as negative energy. Well, uh, this isn't my idea. This, um, if you look in the Feynman lectures in physics, you'll, 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 you'll see an exposition of this. Peter and I have been trying to trace down the, uh, the original point this came from. I thought I knew it at one time, but, um, but, but no, certainly Feynman discusses this. But there is a negative energy. Any attraction between is a potential energy between two any two existing particles which have a gravitational attraction, that gravitational attraction constitutes a negative energy, which gets less negative as you move them apart. So, uh, so, um, so, no, there is a negative energy. It's gravitational attraction. It's an attractive force always, and hence it takes work to get things apart. So, uh, and uh, what what Einstein, point, oh, sorry, what Feynman pointed out is that if you, although if you integrate m c squared over the whole universe, that's a fairly easy integral. Um, you get a certain value, it's quite a big number. So you just take the mass of the universe and multiply it by c squared. But if you take the, uh, and that gives you a positive energy, mc squared integrated over the universe. But if you take each individual particle and then look at the gravitational attraction between all the other particles in the universe, slightly more involved integral, but still fairly straightforward, you get a very large and negative energy. That large negative energy is very close to the large positive energy that you get for mc squared. So if I mean Feynman, and I, I don't know what he was, I don't think it was exactly the sort of plus or minus 12% that Peter was talking about for the initial um, omega equals one universe. I think it was more like a factor of 10. He said, right, if it's within a factor of 10, it's exactly zero. And of course, that's not known yet because you don't know exactly what the mass of the universe is. And as Peter was saying, you don't know the exact distribution of the universe, but it's in the right ballpark. that The, the big positive mc squared energy is equal and opposite to the big negative combinatoric um, gravitational integral uh, negative energy. Now, if um, if gravity is vacuum, the vacuum side of the force, then that is negative energy because vacuum energy is negative. That's the that's the idea. And you see that in the in the Dirac equation when you get plus and minus e, the, the particle is all plus e, and it's the antiparticle which which makes it doesn't produce in large amount, which is minus E. So you've got plus E for the particle and minus E for the antiparticle, which is really the vacuum, ref reflection or inversion of the particle. I thought I read that Dirac uh, discounted that idea later with the uh, positron about the sea of negative energy. I think everybody who thinks that discounts it at least one day and then goes back to it. <laughs> But, but they're wrong to do so because it's a very good idea. And it, and it has an exact parallel in computing where you have a positive, if you binary numbers, positive one 
And how do you get negative one if you've only got one and zero? You just create an infinite string of ones. And that's your kind of negative one vacuum. Complement. Yeah, complement. Two's complement. So it even goes into that. If you privilege one, like you privilege matter, you've got an infinite string of the, the opposite. That's the only way you can make it negative. I think what Peter said about zero was correct. And there's an infinite number of ways of splitting up zero and looking at how that works. Nothing at all. But um, it's not quite the same for negatives, but there are quite a large number of different negatives. And uh, think about the different kind of negatives as there are as well. Negative as in subtraction, negative as in reversion of direction, negative as in handedness, and to right handed. These are all different sorts of negatives. So I think one has to be a little bit aware of the fact that if one's talking negative, there's any negative. Sorry, Peter. Uh, I have a no such thing as a uh, like a uh, particle, like a photon, which carries negative energy. I think that um, that's pretty much equivalent to saying that the radius of something in polar coordinates can be negative. You're going into something which is not negative. No, I, I think there's no such thing as a photon with negative energy. There might be zero. I don't think there's a need for defining um, a negative energy photon, I, but I, I'm, I'm willing to discuss that as well, of course. It bothered me when they said, I think Feynman said that the photon is its own antiparticle. That kind of bothered me since two photons never annihilate to nothing. No, that would not conserve energy. So, so yes. Well, if you had negative energy, then you would be conserving energy if they're if a photon and an antiphoton annihilated. Yeah. Um, for me, there's no such thing as a big energy. Other care, we wouldn't be discussing that with people who thought there was such a thing. In in high consider, talking about quantum dynamics, there is a negative momentum transfer. So, so, so the form of the transfer between something scattering off something else is a negative or positive. If you've got negative scattering off negative, you have a positive momentum transfer. If you've got negative scattering off positive, then you have a negative form of momentum transfer. And that's it. That operates like a negative energy in quantum. So, John, I, we, couldn't hear, we couldn't hear what you were saying. There were some background noises on a couple of mics. Could you say it again, please? Okay. Um, in, in, in quantum electrodynamics, if one's looking at, um, if one's looking at the scattering, so virtual photons. Virtual photons are characterized by a form of momentum transfer squared, which is um, given, given, given by it's E squared minus P squared, which for a mass shell photon, that's a photon on mass shell, is precisely zero. So, 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 so they can have energy, but, but, um, but they can have, um, uh, they can have a rest, their rest mass is given by E squared minus P squared. Well, with some C's in there, if you want, SI units. So the rest mass is zero, but the momentum transfer is given by E over C, by the energy of the photon divided by the speed of light. So, so however, if you're dealing with virtual photons, you can have negative form momentum transfer squared. So then you can have E squared minus P squared is equal to zero or plus or minus. You can have any, and, 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 and the sign of that form momentum transfer is different for plus, for two positive particles scattering or a positive negative particle, an attractive or repulsive force at uh, short distances. That's that's the way that it's characterized there. So within the within that theory, then then one's looking at kind of negative mass photons, I suppose you could call it if you or negative mass squared photons, uh, negative rest mass photons. But that only happens for uh, exchange forces that are virtual. So, um, but that's not the same thing as negative energy because, again, energy is exchanged in such systems. I mean, I mean, Durant may have um, have, have uh, abandoned his idea, but uh, it, it's still valid, and essentially, it's not much different to the Higgs mechanism in in the in the same context. The mass frame. Yeah, the, and the, the the thing is that he only only when I've looked at why this has been abandoned by anybody. They say, well, quantum electrodynamics, you know, has particles and antiparticles coming out of vacuum states and all that kind of thing. But but that doesn't negate the fact that we have really a universe of particles and no antiparticles. 
And of course, bosons don't count because they're they're not particles or antibody, but it's only fermions that count as as antimatter and matter. And okay. so, a question which needs to be answered, and uh, what what we have a material universe and not an anti-material universe. And um, at, at some stage, I've not really developed it very far yet, but at some stage, I hope to uh, give something which is again more speculative, but nonetheless yeah. says something about why we might have a material and not an anti-material universe in a talk to bicycle. But I'm going to put that with appropriate health warnings and say, look, this is not at the level of a of a, of a proper equation, a proper properly founded thing. This is just an idea. So, um, but that will come later at some point. Uh, I have a question on this discussion of energy. Uh, you know, we know that energy is the rate at which action flows through time, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's D by it's D by dt. Yes. So, 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 so the action is given by energy divided by time. Or, or an action is given by energy divided by time, or momentum divided by space. What was the question? We can't, we can't hear Wolf. We can't Wolf, hear you. We can't hear you. You're muted. Got it. Okay, I'm back, I think. Yes. Yes. Um, someone keeps turning on my microphone, so I'm sorry. But uh, no, uh, action is energy times time and time interval, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Momentum is uh, times the distance interval is action. So momentum is uh, a, a, a spatial action density. Energy is a temporal action density action is the fundamental not energy energy is only constant if you assume that the time is constant but time doesn't necessarily have to be constant either so action is the fundamental why are we not talking more about action flow rather than energy action is you're right, action, if we're talking about a Lagrangian field theory action, so energy times time or position times space are action variables, so, uh, or, or um, E times A with a C in there somewhere as well to get the dimensions right. So these things are things that determine the rate of change of phase of a wave function. So the, the things that appear in the E to the I, Kx minus omega T, you have something which is, which is, which is, which is, which is, which is an angle. But um, th that omega is an inverse time in in omega t, leaving something which is a scalar. So 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 um, so if you then have a scalar argument for your wave function, an action is determines the rate of change of phase of that, or, or the change in phase of that wave function. So if you're looking at a principle of least time or a principle of least action, you're also looking at a principle of least phase. So it's related through those things. In that sense, it's um, is it more fundamental than energy? It's fundamental in terms of what changes in, in terms of the in, in terms of the dynamics of a wave function, yes. But in terms of a constraint on the oh, in terms of an absolute constraint, action is not conserved. In fact, the action variables are also subject to an uncertainty relation. So if you look at energy and time or momentum and space, those are the things which are uncertain with respect to one another in a given measurement. Well, so, action is conserved. I mean, you know, when, when you have a photon moving along, it's carrying a chunk of action from one place to the other. Half of the action is on the transmit, half the action is on the receive side. It's the action that is constant. H. But we do use action in calculations. That's the uh, quantum electrodynamics is entirely done in terms of action, principle of least action. Right. Yeah, but that principle of least action is is is, is looking at is looking at an extremum in something which is which is a phase or which is a time. Well, the phase is 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 a particular mapping of 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 an event into a circle, 
and that's why it has to be divided by h bar because you want to have a have a neutral non dimensional uh, quantity in the phase but obviously the phase is is action energy times time or 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 wave numbers times uh, you know it it You've got action in your phase, and it's simply divided by H uh, bar in order to make it uh, uh, non-dimensional and, and and have it be an angle, you know, uh, which, yeah. which is which is an error in the first place. I mean, you know, you, you can't just divide things and get rid of dimensions. I know, which I'm sure that Peter yeah, knows. In his... What you're looking at here is something which which has a value in that it goes between plus and minus one. So as the phase develops, it's following something like a sine wave, or following something which goes one down to minus one up to one. So it has a value in terms of having a magnitude, but not in terms. Sure, of but that magnitude is an action. It's one one uh, uh, period, and the period moves at the speed of light. It's the action itself that is the thing that's being transferred. That's what a boson is about. You know, a boson carries a constant amount of action from one place to the other. Half of it is in the transmitter, half of it is in the receiver. Well, and bosons are one. I think that what's transferred from A to B is an energy. It's energy that's transferred through an action. And the action of that transferring of energy is the thing that is a wave. So so, so it's, it's not right to say that an action is transferred. So, so energy is taken in an interaction Energy is emitted by the emitter and absorbed by the absorber. What's emitted and absorbed is a, is, a, is a quantity of mass energy. But that is intermediated through a wave, and that wave is described by an action. I think is a proper, is a more proper way to say it. Well, I, I, I beg to differ on that, and I think it has to do with perspective. But uh, uh, I, I beg to differ. I, I, would, I would say action is the more fundamental, and energy is only constant when time is constant. I think the reason why we concentrate so much on energy and momentum, even though action is the fundamental thing, is because they're connected with the things we do for measurement, space and time. Correct. And observation, And so that's why we talk about energy and momentum. It doesn't mean that we don't think action is more fundamental in some ways. Because, we, in fact, the calculations that we do, are, as I mentioned, are action calculations. Yeah, if you want to do a path integral to calculate which path takes, then you do a calculation over the action. So, and and and, and that action is is minimised, and and and, um, and the reason for that is that, that it's only those paths that contribute really to an average overall possible path. So, so if if one wants to look at the dynamics, then action is fundamentally important. But in terms of what's transferred into into a frame from a different frame. Then it's energy or well, it's momentum transfer, energy momentum transfer. When action is transferred from one degree of freedom to another, it automatically produces an equal and opposite force on either the transmitter or the receiver, which means that the forces and the momentum transfer is exactly representative by the action transfer from one, one degree of freedom to the other. And I can I can say I can send you the theorem on that because I, that's a very important one. In in order to, I think I think this is this is correct. I don't think uh, I think Wolf is correct. The action is the thing transferred. The energy isn't ever really transferred. If it, really energy is constant all the time, every every point in space has the same energy. The Higgs field. And really what's transferred is something like charge, and that relates to the action. So I think that's fundamentally what's doing. But we loosely talk about transfer of energy because it's convenient to us, the way we measure things. But I don't really think we actually really transfer energy. I think these are different. When we talk about force, that's a different thing to action, which is a different thing to energy, which is, okay, related to momentum. I think these are different aspects of the thing. I think it's not right to say that one is and the other is not the whole story. So, well, I'm sure that's the case. Yes, right. I mean, you have different points of view, sure. We but need all the historically, it's very interesting that Schrodinger did not develop the Schrodinger equation with the uh, imaginary eye in it. The first time it happened, the first time it was actually 
published is, I think it was a Mandel, what's the guy's name, Mandelung Equations. And he attempted to, to, to develop a quantum theory based on action flow as a as action being a flow of uh, an incompressible fluid of some kind. And I don't know what happened to it, but uh, I think, was it Sotina, you know, in one of our conferences uh, uh, presented that, that historic information. But it's interesting. I, I've always tried to figure out where the, where the first I came from in those equations because uh, you can develop the Schrodinger equation completely from the principle of, uh, of uh, small interactions. Uh, that's a totally classical ca uh, calculation. And where the I came from has always, to me, been a mystery. But, but uh, um, well, I don't know if any of you have any insight on that one. Uh, I'd like to hear it. I, I think where the eye is coming from is that you in terms of the development of the schrodinger equation or where the eye is coming from is that you have a single differential and a double differential and you can't match the two sides of the equation without at least going to something which is complex so so it doesn't have to be complex necessarily to make that match but it has to be at least complex so um so 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 that's why the eye really in the schrodinger equation at least that's the uh, usual textbook explanation of it So John, there's a uh, the uh, you, you mentioned a bit before about the virtual photons, and uh, it's an area that seems interesting to me because uh, it's it's one case where you have the pair production coming from a single photon as opposed to a sing uh, as opposed to two, which is what's tied to your model, and you also have the case of photons going off in opposite directions and their momentum changes and they come back to each other which I was wondering what that force was. And at first I thought maybe it was gravitation, but then since then I've wondered if it was your pivot force. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about your thoughts on virtual photons. I, th I think the thing is that whenever one's looking at a physical process, th there are a set of constraints on that physical process. And uh, in my talk on hierarchy of constraints, uh, but I tried to order them and uh, put conservation of energy, that the energy remains constant throughout an entire interaction at the top of those things. So the thing about having photons in free space is um, the experiment of taking two photons in free space and having them hit one another and produce pairs is pretty hard. Um, you could do it in a, in a gamma ray laser, but we don't have such objects yet. It's much easier to do photo production in terms of matter because then it's easier to, to, to make sure that the, the hierarchy of constraints, the energy constraint, the momentum constraint, momentum can be taken up by a recoil from a particle um, happens. You need to have that whole set of constraints um, satisfied in order to have a physical process, an allowed process. So, and there are really quite a lot of constraints on that conservation of different um, of energy and momentum, but also of different kinds of particles, lepton number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all have to be conserved in such processes. So, um, and that's much easier to do in the presence of something to allow a recoil to happen. In other words, in the presence of matter. So, what about the uh, the virtual photons? In that in that case, I think maybe I'm recalling in, inaccurately, but I thought in Feynman diagrams with the virtual photons, a single photon, I mean, single elect electron can. Uh, create two photons, and then they, they come back together again or something like that? You don't always have, you have these circles, but they always converge back. And uh, I thought that the virtual photons, at first I thought they were just cases where the, uh, like in, in the, that they, uh, maybe it was the case of the positron electron, they just didn't have enough energy to completely uh, separate and they the uh, in the case of the electrons they always accelerate it back to each other and then it reannihilate it but I don't think he ever shows two photons when they come back it's always one photon that, that gets released by the annihilation not two John you're muted you're muted 
Here, here's a basic scattering diagram. So you have a, a charged particle coming in, it emits a virtual photon, it hits something. And that virtual photon, if this was electron, you just have a line coming in here, another line going out here. So you have a couple of vertices, and those vertices, that, those virtual vertices. Done, uh, we can't see the diagram. Could you move it over to the left? There we go. OK, so that's, that's, that's a basic uh, Feynman diagram of an interaction with an object. So, so, so that, that virtual photon here is something which is very short range. So within, if we're talking about action in terms of those things, we're talking about a possibility within the uncertainty relation of that thing having positive or negative uh, form momentum transfer squared, or for positive or negative form momentum transfer. And you have a large massive object there which you can, which you can bounce off. So, uh, so, so that can then produce particle pairs because uh, the thing that you create when you hit this thing when, when you hit any object with a, with a, with a very high energy uh, photon, so if we did electron-electron scattering, that electron-electron scattering could um, spool off um, photons as well, real photons. So uh, and it could, th those photons can couple and they can recouple, or they can be emitted, provided that that energy momentum and so forth can be conserved. So, um, so, so, but the simplest thing to think about is that not, not the process of electron positron creation by two photons, but the reverse process, and that's electron and uh, electron positron annihilation. So in, in, in positronium, then you have an electron positron pair, and after a time, and they, they, they deliver really quite a long time, you know, para positronium lives quite a long time. Eventually, the two things will annihilate and come out with a pair of photons. So, um, so, um, so that's the process. If you have an electromagnetic shower, so if you have very high energy particles coming down through um, the atmosphere or through some material, you form an electromagnetic shower where you're transferring from electrons which, for, which scatter, off pro, scatter off photons, which then excite gamma rays, which then excite electrons, which produce electron positron pairs or protons and so on and so forth. You get a cascade, so-called particle shower. These things happen in the atmosphere all the time. So, um, but there are a set of conservation rules, and all those conservation rules must be satisfied for a process to be possible. Is, that, is this answering your question? I'm not sure if I'm answering the whole of your question here. But the reverse process is physically possible. It's difficult to do experimentally. So you're saying it, oh, it ties more to do with moment, conservation momentum. That there, but one of the things I wonder about is, are there, is a virtual photon really any different than a real photon? And it's there's just some some constraint like you're saying momentum, but they aren't virtual; they're actually real. But well, there's just some other constraint that's not from ever escaping. The physical difference between a virtual photon virtual photons are very short range, so they're much less than a wavelength. So in the quantum dynamics, a real photon is a multiple wavelengths, so-called on mass shell, which means its rest mass is zero. Its its mass is not zero; its momentum is not zero, but it's 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 uh, if it's on mass shell, then e squared minus p squared is zero. Is, is, is zero. It's energy in its momentum related by e over c is p. So then it has zero rest mass. Virtual photons do not have zero rest mass. They're I didn't zero. even know virtual photons had a size which is less than their wavelength. Uh, in, in quantum electrodynamics, one's talking about very very short range emission absorption of photons of, of virtual. Uh -huh. So, so in, in a deep elastic electron scattering event, those photons could be 10 to the minus 18 meters in terms of the initial interaction. So very, very short range. Small, smaller than a proton. If they're going to transfer enough energy to start creating particles, they, their, and their interaction length must be smaller than that of the, of the um, smaller than the Compton wavelength, the things that they're going to produce, because that's the only way to get E as H new, to get more energy into Using particle pairs it has to be at least energy is h nu for the where nu is the Compton frequency of the thing. So to get an electron positron pair produced, you're going to need two h nu, then need twice the mass of an of an electron at least, and that's just at threshold. That's not you, you need to go quite a long way above threshold to get significant pair production. Otherwise, it has to be nicely head on. So. So the, 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 there's a whole zoo of things there, Pete. I, I can't it's, not, it's not really right to draw virtual photons as being squiggles because they're more like vectors. They don't really wiggle because they're they're uh, much shorter than a, uh, even a single wavelength. Right. That's right. And 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 that's the same. That's the root of the exclusion principle as well. 
the, uh, uh, of the uncertainty relation as well. Things are things, things are only the reason the reason that you can't. Um, we're getting a little bit off topic here as well because I'm, what I'm basically doing is giving a lecture on on high energy physics, which is perhaps not what we should be doing with Peter's talk. But uh, but there there is a whole lot to be said about that, which is in kind of big textbooks. So, uh, but yes, essentially, yes, you're talking about something which is not really a squiggle. You're talking about something which is within the uncertainty relation. If it was a lot of squiggles, then you would know its wavelength and you would know its um, momentum. And uh, hence, you would not know its position. If you want to measure something down to 10 to the minus 18 meters, you've got to know its position and then you don't know its wavelength. It's not really a squiggle. Or it is a squiggle, but it's a kind of a, a jangling squiggle. It's not, a, it's not a nice noise if you could listen to it. If it's virtual. So could these same things of uh, photons uh, not not being a full wavelength to be occurring when uh, you've got the uh, photons interacting with an electron and some and you get an emission, but sometimes you don't get an emission. It just partially goes out and then it doesn't have enough energy to get out and just gets reabsorbed back in, in, in again. You get a whole zoo of particles. So, but, but that's a whole field of physics and very beautiful field of physics, experimental physics. So, so, but it's kind of a bit off topic of, uh, of dark energy. So uh, we should have this discussion some other time. Okay. I, I, I'd like to have one more question or maybe clarification for Peter, uh, which is that uh, I know you have this idea of, uh, of, of, the, of the nothing uh, separated into a fermion that uh, would then create a whole. Uh, if, if we only consider the mass as being separated out, uh, what is left in the whole, uh, uh, which you always say is a, is a reflection of the rest of the universe and so on, but could you, could you clarify a little more what would be if we just had a uh, a, a mass uh, separated out. What would be left, and and would that be correspond to the fields that you're talking about here and dark matter and so on? I don't think you can just have a mass. You can't have a particle without charges of some kind, electric, strong or weak, or some combination of them. So you can't just have a mass. And that mass always comes because you got charges. So as long as you've got charges, you will get a mass, a, a discrete mass coming out. And a photon, for example, doesn't have a discrete mass and it doesn't have any charges. But if you've got, if you've got a, a discrete mass, then you've got charges somewhere. So it, it's never purely a discrete mass. And if it's got charges, then it, it has potentials with the rest of the universe, whatever they may be. But would yeah, those, would the, would, would, I mean, would those potentials then have some relation to the uh, gravitational potentials that you're talking about? I mean, if, if there's well, if, that, if something that, comes that, out that has a has has a charge and a mass, yeah. then my question would be, what component of the mass that comes out with the charges would you identify uh, left over in the hole? Well, the, 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 you don't have to cancel gravitational you don't have to cancel discrete mass it's you've got to cancel energy but not discrete mass so presumably if you create inertial mass then you also create a gravitational effect at the same time on that mm -hmm. that is the negative energy that you create when you create an inertial mass as we were saying that that's the Feynman argument about the universe that you know you cancel the, the positive inertial energy or rest energy with the with the um, gravitational negative energy. So you would have to create gravitational negative energy. And that would be a, a potential you would have to create alongside the inertial mass. Got it. OK, thank you. May I ask then, may I ask, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about um, non-discrete mass, so, so think about dark energy per se, which also constitutes a mass. We're talking then about a non-discrete mass, some mass which is distributed and, and not associated with particles and not yeah. charge. Yeah, uh, but the non-discrete mass isn't associated directly with the charge. Discrete mass is. 
I think that, that's the difference because charges are discrete and they carry discrete mass, but but I define other mass. Yeah. yeah, it's distributed. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions on on Peter's talk in in, in this flow? Shall we uh, stop recording at the moment? Oh yeah, Pete. Last last week I mentioned a thought experiment, and I wonder how this works into this idea of, of a discrete mass. Of uh, you take a black hole, which has got a certain amount of mass, and you throw a photon at it, and the photon goes around the black hole at the, uh, what do you call it, the, ex whatever. And according to um, John's theory, I think the mass of the, of the black hole would, inc would increase by uh, the size, by the photon mass, right? But it's not really localized anymore. So I'm really wondering if, if there really are two types of mass, that you, you go to a large enough environment like the black hole, the photon is not localized to a small area, but rather could be a rather large area, but the mass of the black hole still increases by the mass of the photon. Yes, I think it would increase by the mass of the photon, but uh, as Pete, uh, discussion last week was also talking about where that mass will be localized in terms of looking at it if one was next to the black hole. The photon mass isn't discrete either. It's not disc it's not associated with the discrete charge. It's it's um it's a you can consider it as a kind of discrete particle, but it's not rest mass, invariant mass, which is what I mean by discrete mass. I'm I'm just wondering if we're we're you trying to solve these problems more using language and less using vision. And that we're getting confused by trying to use language to explain these things as opposed to uh, vision. Well, uh, one, one, many, many of the uh, oldies guys uh, have always said that the particle and its field is always to be considered as one thing. So perhaps uh, uh, talking about uh, a point mass as a source of, of gravitation or so on, uh, separate from its field is not the correct way of talking about it. Perhaps uh, uh, we should always be talking about the combination, in which case we have uh, a semantic statement about something being localized in the, and, and the other aspect of the same particle or the same mass or charge uh, being uh, distributed in its field. You know, so if you consider those two as inseparable, um, then we're talking about two aspects of one one thing, you know, one localized and one uh, one the uh, distributed. Maybe that helps. But I think this is getting semantic at the moment. I think if we're talking about a localized mass, about a defined mass of a particle, that's a well-defined object. If we're talking about the mass of a photon falling into a black hole, of course the energy is increasing because it's falling into a gravitational potential. It's being blue shifted, but the total energy of the system is being transferred to the um, it's still not changing because there's 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 a there's a transfer to the um, to the um, gravitational potential that's also varying that needs to be taken into account. And, uh, oh, well, I wasn't talking about it going into the black hole. I was talking about it going around the black hole in orbit. Yeah. Okay. But but yeah, that's an energy. That's an addition to the energy of the black hole. Not a very big one, unless it's a very big photon. But uh, nonetheless, but but that's a different thing to what Peter's talking about, which is which is talking about charges and localized masses and, and rest masses of particles being associated with one another. It's only fermions that have charge. Right, but but in this case, the, the photon is not really at rest, but I think it's still added to the energy uh, of the mass of the black hole. And I think it's because the photon itself has an intrinsic mass. Yes, that's right. Yeah, but just heating something up adds mass to it, because you're adding energy to it. What do you mean when you say you're adding to the mass of the black hole? Do you mean the total system of photon and black hole has increased its mass? That's right. Uh, but the black hole uh, in and of itself hasn't changed. No, exactly. That, but it shows that the, the photon, even, even though it's not localized, still has a mass. That 
energy is energy and mass are the same thing. There's no such thing as saying that a photon has no mass. That that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think that's correct. But uh, but let's uh, well let's uh, let's come back to um, let's come back to talking about uh, the dark energy uh, side of things. If there are any more questions on that. Shall we uh, stop recording then for the time being and just go to a quick general discussion and uh, and perhaps we'll come back recording if there's something else comes up and uh, okay.